So I, I thought so we far, could- Thank you for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here. It's, like, it's such a thrill. Um, so I thought we would start um, our conversation um, to, by talking a little bit about the in intellectual project um, of a bound woman um, and the shape of the book. So um, the book traces, you know, the history of Black women freedom fighters um, in the U.S. from Ida B. Wells to Asada Shakur um, and to Black Lives Matter. And it begins with this, um, you know, preface that discusses, you know, slavery and the Reconstruction Era South, and it continues by underscoring the atrocities of Jim Crow and the realities of the prison industrial complex today. Mm -hmm. And the bulk, the bulk of the text actually consists, you know, of women's stories, um, often with this historical head note, head note um, and then a poem or a poetry cluster from the voices of these women or sometimes as an ode to them. Um, and what brings together this long trajectory of freedom fighting, um, and these women in particular, is the word bound um, from the title, a bound woman. And bound, you know, is a noun, and it's also a transitive and intransitive verb. And when used as a verb, it's not just about incarceration um, or the way that, you know, one might ordinarily define it. Um, and in your preface, you discuss, you know, being bound in a legacy of love. And you write that the poems are love letters. I am bound in the sense of being beholden to others, you say. Mm -hmm. um, so will you talk a little bit about the word bound and, and what brings these women's stories together? I mean, sure. Um, of course, um, since I started paying attention. Well, let me start here. I, I love people, right? I don't always like people, but in general, I've decided to love people, right? And um, and particularly Black women, because of the investments that they have made in me, not in isolation. I've had mentors of different genders and different races. Um, but some of some of the key investments that were made in my life um, were made um, by Black women. And um, so I try to pay attention to what's going on, right? And um, I started paying attention to the silence around the incarceration of Black women. And um, it really, it kind of got under my skin in a way where I had to know more um, out of being bound in love and that I, I had to write about it. There was no way for me to be reflective about it without the very personal task of writing about it. And those early poems, which started in like 2008 and 2010, are like very much present and a bound woman is a dangerous thing. And so um, when I started pulling the collection together, I really thought about the word bound. And of course we understand it in its negative connotation to be fettered, to be held back, to be reserved. The bound also means to spring forward with a level of enthusiasm and certainty. It also means, as I said, like bound in love. Like I know from a patriarchal sense, we feel that being bound and beholden to someone resembles a type of, a, a, a type of negative bondage, but that's not the case for me. That's not how I interpret it. I'd like to be tied to people emotionally. Um, so I thought about, about that, but also bound has a very personal connotation because it's what we call in terms of demarcation and binding a book, right? And, and this book is a type of mirror for me, but hopefully a, a collection of love letters for some of the women, for the women in the book. Um, I love, I love that, um, especially the part about um, binding of, of a book, which I had not thought about. Um, so will you talk about the process of, of um, deciding which women to include, you know, what, um, what governed that as you were writing and, in, um, and doing your historical research? Sure. Um, I did my research, right? But like, um, all human beings are complex. 
So I like history, but I often don't like the methods of history because they can be reductive and they can tell a single story about a person. Um, I'm not interested in single stories. So each woman um, in the book, I talk about her being bound in a negative way and her being bound in a liberating way. That was important to have that double helix. But it was also important for me that the, the craft around her poem resemble the content of her life in its complexity. That was really, really important to me because especially in, in America where individuality is, is such a big part of our popular narrative, these women are always uh, documented as the first to ever try something and documented as if they operate in isolation without friends, without loved ones, without mentors. And, and that's simply not true. And I try to use a lot of space in the book to draw uh, unsuspecting connections and to show the solidarity that existed before we started talking about solidarity as a, as a Black feminist trope in the 70s. On that note, um, I'm wondering if you would read to us about Claudia Jones, maybe tell us a little bit about Claudia Jones and, and read that portion of the book. Well, Claudia Jones, for me, um, you know, uh, ever since I read her biography and a short summary about her, some of the Angela Davis's work, she really stood out because she was doing the work of labor historians at a time when nobody cared about the work that Black women were doing. But my favorite part about it is, and I don't know if everyone, like, could pick up on the levels of it. I think they could, but I love the little bit of shade in, in this scholarly article that she wrote. The scholarly article goes on and on about the work that Black women do and how 95% of Black women are in domestic service and subject to the same type of horrors that, they, that Black women were subject to pre-emancipation, right? But then she ends it by like, kind of like shading her good communist friends because she was like, even my communist buddies that have Black women in their homes, they're not unionized. So it was like, get your stuff together. Like, I'm not more communist than I am Black woman. This is also important to me. You will not go unchecked for this violation. So um, that type of solidarity, that type of love, and the courage that I think politically it took for her to already be ousted by the democratic government, right? These were like her only friends. And she was like, yo, step up. The same thing that Rihanna did at the NAACP awards. She was like, you all got white friends, tell them to pull up, right? Like be in solidarity with us on this. So um, yeah, Claudia Jones, I think I've seen you left of everywhere. At dawn, when the golden shades the dark, you are a daughter of nations, seamed, stitched with stars, snarling stripes into ribbons and make marks. This is how you send our spirits into rings. I think I have seen you left in the ciphers of Kalalu, swirling about the earth. Trinidad's daughter, Justice's town crier, good, good girlfriend of Army, I'm sorry, of Amy Ashwood Garvey. You fashioned a world from a fissure, a wide rimmed crescent, and welcomed Black women. A nation is built brick by brittle brick, blood in the martyr, a legacy page by sacred page. How many ways did you write women? How many ways did you write women? Thank you. Um, as we're as we're starting here, um, I'm wondering. Um, I mean, especially you know, as so many of us were 
paying attention very closely to um, you know what was happening in the Twin Cities yesterday, um, with the verdict, and um, you know thinking about our our contemporary moment in light of some of the the deep history um, that you uncover here. Um, if you would be willing to talk to us um, just sort of to get the, the scope of the collection as well, a little bit about um, Ida B. Wells um, and the, the poems that you included here. Um, uh, maybe even um, read, you know, one or two um, uh, as part of that as well. Sure. Um, the Ida B. Wells poem is, is very close to me. It's very close to me. Um, we know her as an educator and as a journalist, um, particularly because of her fight against lynching, right? And how she refused to be quiet about the lynching that was occurring um, in the U.S. against Black men. She had substantial evidence that the lynchings were not occurring because of interracial relationships, but because these Black men had actually gathered wealth and status within the community. Um, again, as an act of solidarity, my, my research told me that Ida B. Wells was brought to lynching because her best friend's husband was torn from her bed and lynched. Um, and it began this whole life crusade in solidarity with watching the anguish and disappointment that her best friend experienced. Um, so with that said, uh, some of you that have read the poem can hear the kind of odes that I use to uh, Princess Thieves in the Temple, which is a, a song about sexual assault. We know that sexual assault upon women was the other side of the coin of lynching that we don't often talk about, but that many were engaged in. So um, I'm going to read Ida B. Wells. Um, this, this poem uh, is very weird, which I like, but um, it was important to me that this poem also make uh, mathematical rationalizations and sense, because in 1890s, Ida B. Wells was on the forefront of demography and statistics, and people don't talk about that. So, you know, that's another complexity to our intelligence. So I will try to read this poem this, uh, this today because it's so close to what we're witnessing. And yet an, another girl was shot by the police yesterday in South Columbus, Mykia. The speed of light is almost equivalent as love comes in a hurry, it's almost equivalent to love come in a hurry for Ida B. Wells Barnett the second. The speed of light is almost equivalent to love come in a hurry. There are thieves in the temple, circa 1892 equals 241 lynched. This means torn from their wives arms times rope plus a tree and all of this is set ablaze. Then there is white supremacy and mob violence. 26 states proportional not yet equal not yet united. I'm talking about Alabama with 22 or more lynchings. And then there's Arkansas, 25 people or more hang. In California, they tell us about three, maybe more. In Georgia, they say 11. I doubt if they counted each person. In Idaho, they tell us of 17. In Illinois, they brag about eight or more. In Kansas, the free state, they tell us only one, probably more. In Kentucky, they say three. In Louisiana, they say 29. In Maryland, they say one. In Mississippi, they tell us of 16 people that hang from trees, probably more. In Missouri, we know of six or more people lynched. In New York, they tell us about one, I suspect more. In North Carolina, there are five or more lynched. In Ohio, they tell us of three, probably more. In South Carolina, they say five. In Tennessee, home of the Ku Klux Klan, there are 28 lynchings that year, probably more. In Texas, 
they tell us of at least 15. There are seven bodies swinging in Virginia. In West Virginia, there are five. In Wyoming, there are nine bodies hanging, probably set ablaze. In the Arizona Territory, not yet quite a state, there are three. And then there's Oklahoma. And this is the Durka Delta, the multiplied inverse surge of lynchings. The speed of light is almost equivalent as love come in a hurry. There are thieves in the temples, 160 Negroes, and approximately 80 others, five of them women, two from states over the Mason-Dixon, and one of those states claims to be free. The square root of Black economic prom progress is proportional to pure gold American racism and the demon possession of Francis Willard's good Christians. The speed of light is almost equivalent as upcoming in the hurry. There are thieves in the temple. A black man, Hastings, had the determination of any of the wise men girding through the desert night like a warning star. He is hoisted like a holiday ham. This does not, this is not equivalent to murdering a white man. Dog ears like pages to remember his daughter and son, plus him, lynched, beside him, X equals a black man decorated with bullets. This is the sum of them. Arms, fingers, noses, fracked from their faces like sphinx. Nothing left of his loins. No one to add to his legacy. The sum of black economic progress is equal to lynching on Advent, Christmas Eve, the speed of a light is almost equivalent to love coming in a hurry. There are thieves in the temple. I'm talking about circa 1892, 241 lynch. This means torn from their wives' arms. And then there's rope and there's a tree and all of this is set ablaze. Then there's white supremacy and mob violence. 26 states are not proportional united, are not equal. I'm talking about Alabama. And then there are 22 or more in Arkansas, 25 and more in Florida, three, I'm sorry, in California, three or more in Florida. They tell us about 11 or more in Georgia, 17 or more in Idaho, eight, so they say probably more in Illinois, one in Kansas, proclaiming to be the free state, probably more, three or more body swing in Kentucky, nine or more lynch, 20, Nine Lynch in Maryland, one Mississippi, they tell us about 16. And in Missouri, they say six people. In Montana, they talk about four. In New York, they tell us about one, probably more. North Carolina, they say five. In Ohio, there are at least three people lynched. In South Carolina, they say five. In Tennessee, home of the Ku Klux Klan, home of Andrew Jackson. There are 28 people lynched that year. 15 in the state of Virginia, seven people hanged in West Virginia, five people lynched in Wyoming, nine people in the Arizona Territory, not yet the state, three in Oklahoma, and this is the Durka Delta, the increase, the surge, the multiplied increase of lynchings. The speed of light is almost equivalent as love come in a hurry. There are thieves in the temple. I'm talking about 160 Negroes, 80 others, five of them women, two from states over the Mason-Dixon, one of them claiming to be free. The square root of black economic progress is proportional to pure gold American racism and the demon possession of Francis Willard's good Christians. The speed of light is almost equivalent as love come in a hurry. There are thieves in the temples. At 12 years old, one white girl can be a witness. This means that sleep is burned from her eyes. She becomes one of 10,000 to see the kickings of the heart. They are tearing the black man all apart. At 12 years old, she watches one woman apply a single match to her known lover, 
a black man, a black man, a black man who professes innocence, a flame, thousands of bullets, levy bodies swinging from branches, black economic progress is not proportional to American democracy. I'll stop there. So this poem um, that takes the form, you know, of, of statistics and equations, it looks like math, you know, on the page. And Damaris mentioned it's a weird poem. It, it's this, I mean, it, it looks like something you'd find like on a, on a mathematician's chalkboard. Um, will you talk a little bit about the process of, of creating the equations and, and your relationship um, with Ida B. Wells's um, sort of interest and important work in, in statistics? Sure. It, it was hard. I have degrees in English. You know, I'm, I'm the type of person where um, I was only successful in passing my algebra courses or my mathematics courses in high school and in college because I knew how to average really good and I would get A's as long as I could and, you know, probably just fail the rest, likely fail the rest and come out of there with a C and, and a well wish, like, good luck. But, um, so this poem, I didn't want to negate the complexity of Ida B. Wells. That had been done so much. So I started trying to learn to speak math. And for days and for days and days, I was just kind of looking at the mathematic symbols and what meaning they would translate and how they would work. And like for four days, I was just like running up against the wall. But um, I used to be very interested in cognitive linguistics and the ways that we can teach ourselves to be smarter. And so I know from that earlier research in my life that for me, very sophisticated and eclectic music elevates the ways that my brain creates connections and schemas. So for that entire four days, as I was trying to figure out this poem, I was listening to Thieves in the Temple and thinking about the ways that the artist formerly known as Prince was able to take such a violent story, narrative and subject because he does not cheat the lyrics of that song and still create something that is beautiful. And so I, I, I tried to be that person in, in, in literary form. And then after four days, it finally broke and I was able to write a draft. And then of course it took many revisions from that draft, but it took four days just to start the draft. the piece. Mm -hmm. So this next question, it's about the genre of the book. Um, so <laughs> I, I prefer, I, <laughs> I, I, I mean, this is something fascinating to me. You know, I, I saw it referred to as a memoir in verse, which I thought was really interesting because, you know, memoir usually designates a, a very personal history, um, which I think is, is fascinating in relation to this book which is a um, personal and intellectual project. And, um, you know, the head notes, um, each of these um, women in the book have a historical head note and the head note has a certain sort of voice, you know, in addition to the, the lyric and like for the Eartha Kitt um, head note, um, this voice says, I love her, you know, and um, for Harriet Tubman, um, it's very historical, but then there's also this moment where it says, you know, it is reported that she liberated hundreds of people but I'm sure the count is off. She's liberated thousands. And so there's this chilling, even, even in the historical um, you know, part that we think of as, um, as somehow divorced from personal sentiment or emotion or something like that, there's this voice that comes through. So I'm wondering if you could talk about the genre and also about your relationship to you know, these um, artifacts of history um, or you know, your goal as a historian and a poet. 
Sure. Um, so when I initially began this project, I thought I was engaging in, um, and I and I was a type of rememory, as as Morrison puts it. And then you know sometimes we read a little bit more and we get to know ourselves in a little bit more. And I'm also embracing a theory by Sadia Hartman that talks about critical fabulation, and actually taking the artifacts and the history and piecing together a, a human story from from these spaces, right? Rather than a national uh, narrative and bringing these artifacts to life. And I think that is another process that I'm heavily engaged in. But I wanna like specifically talk to the writers right now because I wrote a book for me, right? Um, there wasn't any precedent that I knew of that the publishing industry was gonna take me on my own terms. And I'm so grateful that my publisher did. I totally expected to give the book to a publisher and the book make, and the publisher tell me to choose, right? Like you can publish the poems, or you can do this other scholarly book. Um, and this has special significance for, for me as, as a woman and as a black woman, like something that I tell myself and I giggle about is that I don't know one specific law or like a constitutional mandate that was like set up for black women, right? Like I always have to adapt myself to fit those spaces. And oftentimes you can't ever be your full self in a professional space. That's not how capitalism is set up. Capitalism says, we're gonna buy a piece of you for this amount of time, for this amount of money, and this is what we value. So um, I wrote the book for me and um, I also say like for my nieces and for my granddaughter that is not yet conceived, already loved, it's for them, right? She's not here yet, I love her anyway. Already love her, right? And so I gave them the book that I would want them to have. I was just fortunate enough that um, my publisher had enough money from J.K. Rollins and Harry Potter to take a risk on me. And the risk worked out. I mean, she even said after the first marketing meeting, I have like an editor, she's like a 70 year old, uh, like second wave feminist woman. And my, my agent is like an 80 year old second wave feminist Jewish woman. And so, you know, they're, they're just like superheroes anyway. But she was like, look, I didn't know everybody was gonna like the book. She's like, but I was with you anyway, because this book is important. And then, you know, to be, you know, for Eve Ensler to come and blurb the book and Roxane Gay and Ada Lamone and, and, and Mitchell Jackson, like I, I didn't expect any of this particularly because I felt that the book was so queer, not, you know, not regulated to a sexual sense, but just, you know, queer as, as I am queer, right? Like not wanting to be beholden to one category. Um, and that actually showed up in the reception as well. When we got the nod about the history book, we were like, oh, okay. What, I mean, you know, we weren't going to turn it down, but we surely didn't expect it, you know? Most anticipated history book. All right. <laughs> you know, like, do they know it's poems in there? Like, did, did they see it? Like, you know, and even the histories on purpose are written in a type of Black woman vernacular, not in a singular voice, but I wanted the histories to be a history that I would tell one of my girlfriends. Like, you know, she hangs with this person. You know, they said this about her, but she really is this. And I wanted, kind of wanted that 
kind of playfulness and that tension and that that celebratory type of speak in there, common celebratory type of speak. I hope that wasn't too much. I felt that was really long, sorry. No, it was amazing. I mean, just to hear, um, you know, about your process and, um, you know, following um, really this, this project of passion, which it makes it, some of the um, multi-genre devices that you're employing is what makes it readable, right, and unique. And it is a work of history, um, as it is a work of poetry. And that's, um, you know, one of the things that makes the text so important. Um, I, I'm thinking about when you say that this is written um, for your granddaughter who has not been conceived, um, I'm thinking about some of the contemporary figures um, that you also include because, um, you know, there, there are quite a few. And I'm, I'm wondering if you'll talk to us maybe a little bit about Grace Jones um, and about her poem. Absolutely. I mean, who cannot love Grace Jones, right? Um, but you know, some people were a little bit like, well, why is, is Grace Jones really engaged in a type of resistance? You know, I think a lot of people question about the presence of Grace Jones, but not only was Grace Jones like, um, kind of um, twisting the gender notions on, on their head, but what I liked or what I enjoyed reading about Grace Jones is when she finally left her husband, she left her husband because she felt that he was in love with the persona of Grace Jones and not the person. She was like, you don't even know me. You know, and so like even the resistance in that, right? To walk away from what others perceive as ideal and a pinnacle and to choose love and freedom, right? Something genuine over, over that, which is perceived to be a lot of power and access. So um, yeah, Grace Jones um, is a poem that's written in two columns. So they can be like two separate poems or they can be one poem. So maybe I'll read uh, the poem in two columns first and then I'll go back and read the, the, the whole poem together. So Amazing Grace and Unloved Gentiles. Your love is one of acrobatics on the runway, one side white with pleasure. Glamour is picking your teeth. Security is knowing your stiletto. Power pulses through your knees. Make God call your name. Make her believe that you are daughter. Enchant, emblazon, transfix, disciples. Make Adonis hate you. Let everyone with rage. Make Orpheus turn between your hips out of thick until he cast all mirrors into the garden, your genitals in your hands, they an adaptation. Wearing a tilted hat with fright, the other soiled deep with a glittered peacock feather. An ax extending from your hips, thrust them, your nose in the straits with curiosity, Make Aphrodite evil, the second coming. Make father forget your face of stone, a religion. Paparazzi, know that Cupid is your crybaby. Jealous, his beautiful boys crawl. Curiosities, wear your brother's suits. Spit shards of glass into his ribs. Consecrate unloved Gentiles. All right, amazing grace and unloved Gentiles. Your life is one of acrobatics and adaptation. Wearing a tilted hat on the runway, one side white with fright, the other soiled deep with pleasure. Glamour is picking your teeth with a glittered peacock feather. Security is knowing your stiletto, an ax extending from your hips. Power pulses through your knees. Thrust them, your nose in the straits. Make God call your name with curiosity. Make Aphrodite evil. Make her believe you are the second coming. Make father forget daughter. Enchant, emblazon, transfix your face of stone of religion. Paparazzi, disciples. Make Adonis hate you. 
let everyone know that Cupid is your crybaby, jealous with rage. Make Orpheus turn his beautiful boys, crawl between your hips out of thick curiosity. Wear your brother's suits until he casts all mirrors into the garden, spit shards of glass into his ribs. Consecrate your genitals in your hands, they unloved Gentiles. I'm wondering if you would talk a little bit, um, maybe from a craft perspective about the doubleness in the poem, um, and also about this play between genitals and, and Gentiles that you do at the end that I think is so fascinating. Okay, um, I'll go with genitals and Gentiles first. Um, so Grace Jones is like holiness church, like legacy. So her brother is like the huge mega pastor, Noel Jones. And apparently, this is what I heard from another scholar, that um, Nelson Mandela wanted to meet Grace Jones. And so she went over to uh, South Africa and took her dad. And since she visited Nelson Mandela in South Africa, there are now like 5,000 holiness churches in South Africa. So like, and even in her um, secular performances, she maintained some of the legacies and inheritances of the, the church dogma. So that's why I'm kind of playing with this, um, subversively about it being a subordinate gender of women in the church, right? And how she's this very powerful woman, right? And has done so much for the church in, in, in ways that they did not expect a woman to do, to represent the church in that way, to be a type of diplomat, a global diplomat, right? From Jamaica to New York, to, you know, the world's stage as a model, then as a singer back in Jamaica, then going to meet Nelson Mandela, even being invested in humanitarian and politics, right? And actually making change in every space that she entered, right? Um, but also just when it comes to writing, I like to play. I used to be really, really, really invested in, I mean, I still, I still like a good form. I like all the boundaries of form. I like a good, a good poem in form. It feels nice and comfy, but about five to seven years of writing in form, I figured out that I found more pleasure from breaking form. So every time I enter a poem, I enter the poem for the narrative trajectory, right? And then once I think I've said all I have to say or what I want to say, then I start playing. And maybe, you know, it's like dance or ventriloquism or just abstraction, right? Like I've made, I've made this, what can I make it become? How can I liberate it from the space that it's in? Um, that play and experimentation is also very important to me because in each poem, I try to create a sense of tension that the reader will know what it feels like um, for a body marked as Black in public society to feel. So if you are feeling things, if you are gritting your teeth, if you are holding your breath, hopefully I'm accomplishing that task. But I want that from every poem. Amazing. I so I um, recently saw this talk. Um, scholar um, Tavia Nwango um, was talking about Grace Jones, and he was trying to, um, you know, wrest Grace Jones from this. Um, you know, racist lens of sort of um, primitivism that's been, you know, foist upon her. And he was instead trying to um, ask people to look at her performance um, through um, the lens of what he called black trans rage. 
Um, and he said that if we're able to see her performance this way, then um, we can see that it's the gaining of insurgent ground. Um, and that quote, the gaining of insurgent ground is, is from Horton Spillers. And so he was, he was doing a, um, a reading of her song, William's Blood um, in the talk, but I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, this last thing that you said um, about the feeling, um, you know, what it, what it feels like to be in a certain subject position and that your forms are working, um, you know, toward that feeling. Uh, you know, I'm wondering if you want to talk about like how you frame, you know, Grace Jones or the, or sort of the the what it means to to write an ode to Grace Jones or to feel Grace Jones, um, even just in the in the head in the head note to this poem that you read, the the line that echoes with me is um, she cannot be boxed in, she will change and become new again. Um, and so when you're talking about breaking form, you know, my my mind is sort of exploding because it just seems um, very apropos to sort of your deep work with with your subject here, too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I just I, I, I tried to imagine the 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 beauty, the physical dexterity, the power that comes in the feminine form that that Grace Jones possesses the authority onto which she enters spaces. I wanted to bring all of that to the page and, and the lines are very phallic, you know, they're, they're, they're very straight. They're very, you know, dark E like, right. But I also didn't want to escape um, desire, which is a huge part of her persona, right. And I tried to create a persona of desire without um, the sexuality exclusively as a gaze. That's why I've like, there's a gaze, like she's, she's tackling it, right? She's dismantling that gaze. So I, I think Nongo has um, a very good point. I did not see that lecture, but I'm, I'm for it. I can see it. Yeah. And I think it's important to talk about her like that. She understood performance. She understood the power of performance and the way that she could captivate others in performance. And I think it's important to think about a girl from Jamaica, right? A former colony, a post-colonial country with not um, that doesn't have wealth equity, right? Um, what does it mean for her have to, to have to leave there and have a different life? What does it mean for her to be a girl that was born of one family, inherited to another, and even in the religious context of her denomination, needs to always be present with a chaperone or a, a somebody that's supposed to be protecting of her. What does it mean for her to totally take ownership over that and to flip it on its head, right? What does it mean for her to become the queen, the power in all of those spaces that told her that, that, that she would be the submissive in the person? the 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 dim, demuted right and i'm just talking off the top of my head so i hope that wasn't too long but i'm i, I really like try to think about that with grace jones um so in the in the conversation that we had um preparing for this event damaris we um we talked about how many ties this text has to Baltimore. Um, and so I'm thinking mm -hmm. in this um, final question before um, you know, we allow others to, to ask questions in the Q&A, um, maybe um, you could talk a little bit about um, some of the stories and the, the women who either were from Baltimore or had connections to Baltimore, because I'm sure um, that people in the audience would be very interested in that. Yes. So. Uh, the first chapter of the book is all about um, ancestors. Um, and so there are blood ancestors and ancestors of legacy. So the ancestor of legacy that is really present in the first chapter is 
former uh, Maryland Poet Laureate, Lucille Clifton, right? Um, and I did my master's thesis on Lucille Clifton under the encouragement of Monifa Lovasanti. I called Lucille Clifton. And this is what you need to know about smart uh, women, especially smart veteran women. I love them. So back in these days, and some of them still do it because I've seen them do it. They'll sit by an answer machine and they'll listen to people call and they'll decide whether or not they're going to answer the phone. So I called one time, she did not answer. I called the second time and I was leaving another message. She, she didn't answer the second time. And it must've been like a month or two later, I was calling the third time and I started leaving my message and she picked up. And then she was just there on the phone. And then, yeah, you know, Lucille Clifton just remained generous to me. She allowed me to come to her house. She introduced me to many people in the larger poetry community, academic community, particularly a Furious Flower and Joanne Gavin, who is very much a mentor and a friend to me now, who's also a Morganite, who's also from Baltimore. Um, and so I'm very, I'm very grateful for that. So I, I want to, uh, I guess, read a poem for Miss Clifton. Um, I'm going to read In the Garden. It's a shorter poem, but it's, I mean, I love all of the poems are with Miss Clifton, but it's one of my favorites. So In the Garden, an echo poem for Miss Clifton. In this garden of marble and men, I swivel slowly in. I am some clay-faced Janice following the drums of your tongue. Did you know these halls are prone to echo? God is dead, yet the walls are greedy for confessions. Your words mirror my truth. Forgive me, my voice is a tapestry of tacks trying to wear the skin of your hymns. Um, and so, yeah, she's she's in the first chapter. And I thank her for all of the space and encouragement and and love and you know everything that that, that she shared with me, you know? I would I would be vastly different without that. Um I don't know how much time we have, but there um in the second chapter, um that's based on Callie and Gross's Colored Amazons. Um, this is a book of like sociology and anthropology and, and history. She is also a multidisciplinary scholar. Callie and Gross is like amazing. And this is like her first book. But this book was so well written that when I finished reading this book on Black women and incarceration, I think I wrote. I wrote poems immediately. I might've wrote like 13 poems right then. And I might've had like 40 different poems from reading her book. Like I just couldn't stop writing about the people that she introduced me to in that book. And so um, let me, I'm gonna ask you again, Keegan, how much time do we have? Cause I wanna make sure I have time to read Harriet Tubman cause it's just not fair. Um, well, I was thinking we would open it up to the Q&A in about five minutes. Um, okay. So I think we could do both. I think we can do both. So both of these people are from the Eastern Shore of Maryland. So this particular case uh, in Callie and Gross's Colored Amazons revolves around um, a Black woman who historically we may have called something like Octoroon. She, she could pass for white. Or Quadroon, she could pass for white. Um, but she maintained her black woman identity and was locked up in, in Philadelphia like many women were. So this is called Blackbird Medley. And this woman was from Cambridge, Maryland. And so I'll read the poems. Blackbird memory, melody, excuse me. One, blue, vein, blue veins bind my wrists. Rosary stitched my palms. I passed through Eastern a yellow canary, my voice an ebony tongue. Hell Mary, no grace, black soul in the middle like Psalms. My mother's Bible songs, a broken heart's balm. My lips carry her cello harmonies. Light skin can't hide what the ears 
clearly see a voice that gullies and steadies your qualms. White stains my skin and ripples in my hair bears witness to a father I dare not love. Each strand a dusty crack cross Ray Street. An eyelash threading a wish, a prayer layered in cobblestones to be white, drifting each face it passes, refuses to greet. Two, not a white woman, nor do I wither. In darkness, I bruise a blue rose, blooming between brick, I quiver. Not a white woman, nor do I wither. My songs crawl, my voice slithers, frost bit lips trill away my woes. Not a white woman, nor do I wither. In darkness, I bruise a blue rose. Three, silence, no song. Beat me, bid, quiet, gag me, dead. Four, something has died. There, silence, where a song once lived. Iron cuff, neck, wrist, no heaven, no one forgives. Persecute me, an ice water baptism wakes my soul for refusing new boss man first day on patrol. This warden, Cassidy, wants me to waltz wrong, turned right, whispering. Life is better if crazy and white. You solo dance cracks between alabaster tile. You live in the black. You gleaned white all the while. Number five, blackbird oriole can do anything but sing alone. She needs sisters, black winged melodies, the souled contraltos of dark angels. Okay, I'm gonna let anybody ask one question and then I'll read Harriet Tubman before we get off. Does that work for you, Katie? That sounds great. Yes. Um, so I think Courtney is the one who has access. I actually can't see the, the Q&A here. So I think Courtney is going to run um, that part of the meeting. Um, but thank Hi, you Courtney. so much Hi. for this conversation. <laughs> okay. So um, hi, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Courtney Hobson. I'm program coordinator for the Dresser Center for the Humanities. Um, and many thanks to Damaris and to Keegan for such a wonderful conversation. I think it was it's a much needed uh, topic, a conversation in light of um, what happened in Columbia yesterday and and for all for all black women and all black girls. Um, so if you all have any questions, um, again, please type them into the Q and a uh, chat. Um, you can access that by typing by um, clicking on the three, um, dots on the bottom right and then typing them in. Um, so we do have one question from a Jasmine Thornton. Um, Jasmine asks, is there such thing as self lynching or is that just a lack of attention to mental health? Um, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that, but what I will say is that um, self care is essential in these times. It's important to know your well of empathy and what, what you will expose yourself to or what you are exposed to, whether it's self-inflicted or otherwise, will change you. That's, that's like Octavia Butler gospel right there. Everything you touch will change you and everything you touch changes it. Um, as a person that has a deep well of empathy, there are certain things that I cannot subject myself to. So I didn't watch the George Floyd trial. I did not watch the George Floyd video in, entire, in its entirety. What I did see were only snippets that I didn't know to avoid. Even Sandra Bland's the 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 traumatic video of her lynching and her experiences. I did not watch the whole thing because um, I will stay in that place with them, and I have not left this reality yet. And I can't exist in both right now. 
So I'm careful about what I subject myself to. And I encourage everyone to be careful about that. I, th I do think there is a, I do think there is a, a move, a motivation to make black pain normalize and black victimhood normalize. I'm not gonna buy into that or support it. That's it. Okay, so I think um, you're going to read uh, one more poem about Harry Tubman and then we'll return um, yeah. to, to questions. And I, and I just wanted to say, I don't know if you've heard the news, Damaris, that um, archeologists believe that they have found Harry Tubman's um, father's home on the Eastern shore. I, I can share that link in the chat and send it, send it to you as well, um, if people are interested in that story, but they believe they found so. Um, while people are typing their questions in the chat, um, if you could grace us with one more poem, please. Sure. Um, so I'm going to read Harriet is Holy. I don't know if you guys can see that. Um, so I called the poem initially a triptych, like three poems in one, but it's kind of like a quadrapunzel because it can be read in any direction and start at any point. And um, this was because of many failures. I failed at like 17 Harriet Tubman poems because I kept trying to situate her in a certain time and space, but that was not indicative to who she was. We, could, we never knew where she was and what she was doing. This super spy, genius, ecologist, liberator, nurse, and all that she was to think that we can know her time, space, and location, I think was presumptive. So I, I had to throw all those poems out and this is what, what is left. So I'm gonna read it a normal way, left to right. Um, and then I'll read it a swirly way. Harriet is holy. Lick a thumb, hold hands to the wind. What is it about? Water, women. Take me Miss Tubman in tow. Her instructions make my mark, X, a river be as faithful as daughter of Eve, mother of Cain, her face a rainbow wonder, her smile a collection of stars of spring, between water, between women, be no mysteries. I know of no man stands waist deep and wet in these crossings, mossy riverbeds like braille fold in her feet. This woman needs these sweet waters in her palms, Thousands call her Moses, asks the stars. Even Jesus needed a John the Baptist with arms wide. Her, she in the intersections, she the revolver rescue. I'm starting over. Harriet is holy. She be revolver rescue with arms wide, ask the stars, thousands this woman needs, mossy riverbed stands between water, between women. Her smile, mother of Cain, a river be, her instructions make. What is it about? Hold hands to the wind. Take me, Miss Tubman, and tell X, daughter of Eve, a rainbow wonder of stars, of springs, I know of no man, these crossings fold in her feet, in her palms, her Moses, a John the Baptist, she in the intersections, her even Jesus needed, call these sweet waters like braille, waist deep and wet in be no mysteries. A collection, her face, as faithful as my mark, water, women. Look at them. Thank you so much, Damaris. Thank you. Um, um, I've put the link in the chat uh, for those who are interested in reading about um, the recent archaeological find. Um, and so I'm going to continue on with some of the questions that we have. Um, one question is from Sarah Jo. Um, she's interested in the title of the collection, A Bound Woman is Dangerous to Who? What does it mean to be dangerous? Should women aspire to be dangerous things? And should we embrace our boundedness? 
Well, that was another type of entendre, right? So like on the surface, what I mean is like, it's too dangerous to be incarcerating these women. The incarceration rate of black women has risen over 800% in the past decade and not a peep about it. We're still focusing on the incarceration rate of men largely, right? Not a peep about it. So when these women are moved, their children are moved in, into alternate care systems. I used to teach in Baltimore City Public Schools. You know how many of my students have at least one parent in prison? How many of my students were not living in the same home with their parents? There are over 2 million children with at least one parent in prison. And these women, it's also dangerous because I think it was like 80% of these women have an average of two or more children and are making less than $20,000 a year. These are dangerous conditions that are subjecting women to prison, to dismantling families because of poverty that can be changed, in my opinion, no, can be changed with legislation. People need to be paid a living wage, period. Um, but what I also mean very seriously, that if you see, if you walk into any room and you find a woman bound, you can trust, but trust and believe she has already proven herself to be dangerous to whomever who has bound her. Because if not, she would be walking around freely and accessible to that person for another type of uh, biological sexual currency. So she's already proven that she's not gonna be subject to that. So if you walk in a room and you see a woman that is bound, she's already taken a life or has proven that she will take yours because they, they, she wouldn't be bound otherwise. So I was playing with that. I was also kind of tongue in cheek playing with men that wanted to envision women being bound in their all types of sexual fantasies. And that's not what this book is about. You know, I like to play. I do like to play. Um, our next question comes from Kendall Hardwick. What is difficult to create a cohesive narrative out of poetry? How did you know where to place each work? Ha <laughs> ha, I didn't. Um, editors help with that a lot. And this is only one third of my original poetry manuscript. Uh, my agent told me to break my poetry manuscript up. She said, the histories are doing something, let's deal with the histories first and then do something else with the other parts. So that's what happened. I, I need an editor all the time. I'm, extre I'm extremely insecure about my writing. This is the most insecure part of my life. I don't know when work is done. Most of the time when work gets published, it's because people um, tell me to submit it or take it from me or tell me that they need it. I'm, I'm just never sure that the, the work is done in that way. And I didn't mention it before, but I acquired an agent because I'm a fiction writer too. And she was like reading over my fiction and prepping my fiction to be sold for a year before she found out I wrote poetry. And then when she read the poetry, she called me that night and she said, Poetry is coming out first. And I'm like, lady, you are crazy. Nobody can eat off of poetry. I, I have student loans and a son in college. You are insane. Uh, but again, she's an 80 year old second wave Jewish feminist. So I said what I said, she said what she said. I went back to writing my novel for a year. And when I put that novel on the desk, the first thing she asked me is where's the poetry? I told you. The poetry was coming out first. So, you know, then I gave her the poetry and then she calls me one night. She's like, 
I'm giving the poetry to Bloomsbury. And I'm like, woman, Bloomsbury doesn't have any poets. You are insane, right? But by this time, I learned to stop talking crazy to her. So I was just like, oh, you're giving it to, to Bloomsbury. She's like, yeah, I'm giving it to Bloomsbury. So I hang up the phone and I call my friends screaming that this woman has lost her mind. And then she calls me back two days later and she was like, she loves it. They have to vote on it, but she loves it. And that's how I ended up on Bloomsbury. We, we never imagined this. We did not envision this, you know? So editors help a lot. That's what I have to say. Okay, our next question comes from Mary Beth Kay. How do you continue to be curious, playful, and hopeful in your work, even when delving into some of the most disturbing moments in history? Ha, huh. when I am not writing, I am watching stand-up comedy almost exclusively. That is the only way I keep from being medicated, probably. Because I can really, like I haven't, I haven't written honestly about Breonna Taylor because I haven't figured out how I'm gonna get back in. I haven't figured out how I'm gonna get back in. So um, I, that's what I do. Like, I mean, I also teach about, you know, uh, Lucille Clifton used to have a course called um, Unpopular Moments in American History. And that's pretty much, I, I probably teach a version of that. Um, so I, I watch a lot of stand-up comedy. But there are also great writers. Stand-up comedians teach you about time in your writing, about rhythm. They teach you how to word economy, how to make every word count in a story. They are great. Who are some of your favorite um, stand-up comedians? Hands down, Richard Pryor. Moms Mabley, um, Dave Chappelle. I used to be like, you know what? Dave Chappelle is like 99% of Richard Pryor. Now he's like 99.8% at Richard Pryor. Like he might be at Richard Pryor. They took way too long to give him the Mark Twain Award. Way too long. Um, there's this new um, comedian and she does not have uh, like her own special per se yet, but she's on Tiffany Haddish's series of specials. Her name is Ida Rodriguez Prestine. She's talking about some really, really painful things in a really, really funny and artful. And like, she's, she's also teaching you educational way in a transformative way. Like that is the difference between like somebody that can make me chuckle and a good stand-up comedian. A good stand-up comedian uses the vehicle of laughter to transform you intellectually. And those are the comedians that I'm interested in. So uh, I also like Bill Blair. I like um, um, Louis Black, you know? Um, I, I like those guys. Chris Rock, of course. Um, yeah, I like those guys. Um, Sarah Nove has another question. Um, how do you know a poem has quote unquote failed and how do you redeem a failed poem? Oh, I teach, I teach, I teach, teach workshops on that, on how to redeem failed poems uh, through techniques similar to remix. Um, but there are plenty of poems and plenty of women that I wrote about that didn't make it to this book because the poem failed for me because it wasn't as good as it needed to be craft-wise to express the complexity of the woman. So it didn't make the book. I, like there are, there are like two or three poems in this book that I still am not totally cool with. So like the poem has to be like 93 and above. I have to be that happy with it before I wanna put it in a book. And I'm obsessive about revision, again, because I'm insecure. Um, another, another question from Alexa Anglin. 
Um, they ask, was it difficult getting into publishing after college? Absolutely. I've been out of college a long time. I'm an old person. I just impersonate people that are much younger than I am. Um, yeah, it, it's, writing is very difficult. Like one of my friends told me that there are 6,000 books published every week. We don't even know 6,000 people that are reading. We know like five people that read, right? And so like as a leisure activity anymore. So there's a lot of books and print out there. Um, it's hard. It's hard. It takes years sometimes to find an agent. I treat all of my writing relationships like, like their marriages. Like I take them very seriously. I don't just do business with anybody. Like we got to have a couple of talks, interviews and dates, you know what I'm saying? To figure out if we can work together for years. Other people are not like that. I have one of my friends, a very successful writer. She's had a different agent for every book. She's like on her like six or seven book. I'm like, how do you do that? How do you form these bonds with all of these people? Um, I think what I should tell you most is that the journey is different for everybody. People tell you how it should go. And the real truth is it doesn't, it never goes like that. It's like life. There's like a norm and then there's your life. My, my, my publishing trajectory and my writing trajectory have, have been the same thing. Okay, we have a question from Earl Brooks. Have you hey, thought Earl Brooks, Dr. Earl Brooks? <laughs> Have you thought about how your book is such a powerful counter narrative to the normally masculinized focus on the incarceration of black men in black television and film? If so, could you elaborate? No, I have not thought about that, Earl. I just wanted to make sure that, that we paid attention to women. I didn't think about it. Um, being a, a powerful counter narrative. I mean, for maybe, maybe for the same reasons you see it as being a powerful counter narrative. I want to reiterate that we did not, I did not believe that this book was going to be published in more than like 500 copies. I did not believe that this book was going to be published in this form, right? I thought as soon as somebody saw it, they were going to make me be a piece of myself all over again. Because again, that's how capitalism works. So they can sell a piece of me, right? And so, no, I didn't think about any of that stuff, Earl. But if you have some insights, Dr. Earl, share them. You know, I haven't really been paying as much attention to men and incarceration. Because there are a lot of people doing that work. Um, not that I'm not empathetic, because I'm very empathetic. Um, and again, I want to uh, thank Mitchell Jackson, who writes about his own experiences with incarceration. And he's a he's he's a guy, a man that blurred my book and invested in my book. So, um, but I haven't been paying as much attention because I've really been spending about like twelve years working on this book. I'll make sure the two of you connect if y'all don't have each other's uh, email addresses afterwards. Well, we, we went to the same graduate school. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, there we go. Um, okay, I think this is our last question. Um, this is from Susan McDonough. Um, you noted that you landed on the form of Harriet is Holy after failing in previous attempts. Yes. Yeah. Could you speak a bit more about productive failures? how you know when to keep going or when to move on to something new. Right. I'm glad you're asking this question because it's important that we talk about this question, particularly in this forum of like higher education. People tend to think when you are an English literary scholar and or writer that writing is is like the creative writing track is easier than the literary scholar track. And I wanna stress that they are two different skills 
completely. My job as a writer is to condense the world and to put it into the page and line. My job as a literary scholar is to take a page or a line and make it the world. They are two different skills entirely, right? Um, so the, the artist part of me, like that is intuitive. If you try to control the writing, the writing will suck. If you are a creative writer that tries to control the narrative, control the writing and not give the writing um, its liberty to be and to shape and to form itself, it won't be beautiful. It won't be beautiful. You can't, you can't dominate your muse. It has to be a collaboration or it's not going to work. Now, literary criticism, that, that's your whole job, to be the authority and the dominator of, of the work that somebody else wrote, by the way, right? So it's like, it's, ooh, I'm getting ready to say something, give me, it's almost like a colonization of a work as a literary critic. Now, there are ethical and justifiable ways to do it, because even when I write about other people's work, I try to be in partnership rather than in a hierarchical relationship. But there's only one way to do the creative work, and that is with courage, with risk, and with liberatory intentions. If not, it won't be anything that, that you'll be proud of or that other people can invest in. That's usually when a when a poem or a piece is not working. It's been worked too much. Okay, I think that is our last question for the afternoon. Um, I would like to thank um, Damaris Hill and Keegan Cook Finberg for um, joining us and having a great conversation. Um, I think this is a wonderful work that you all should check out as soon as possible, either from your local library or from your local bookstore. Um, and I think this is a great transition to our final event of the Humanities Forum um, with Ruth, Ruth Wilson Gilmore next Thursday at 4 p.m. on Making Abolition Geographies. Um, I thank you all for joining us this afternoon, and I hope that you all have a great day. <laughs>